7 Important Things Christians Should Understand About Solar Eclipses Number 1. What Happens During a Solar Eclipse A solar eclipse occurs when the moon moves between the Earth and the sun, blocking some or all of the sun's light from reaching the Earth. This phenomenon occurs due to the regular alignment of the Earth, moon, and sun's orbits, which causes the moon's shadow to fall on Earth. Specific regions of North America will be in the path of totality for the upcoming eclipse in April. People in certain areas will experience a total solar eclipse. This event lasts only a few minutes, but it offers dramatic sights. During the eclipse, observers can witness the sky grow dark, making it seem like nighttime during the day. Number th Are there events similar to the eclipse at the end of the age? The answer is yes. Jesus provides key signs that all share a common theme related to the skies. At this point, he also tells his disciples that he will return on the clouds and that believers will meet him in the air. These signs and promises direct our attention upwards and encourage us to look towards the heavens. The False Prophet The False Prophet, the leading supporter of the Antichrist, will create a striking sign in the sky. The extent of this person's abilities may to turn away from their faith. Matthew 24 gives us this insight. Then, if anyone says to you during the Great Tribulation, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and they will provide great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect, God's chosen ones. Matthew 24, 23-24 Revelation 13 discusses the achievements of this false prophet. He performs great signs, awe-inspiring acts, even making fire fall from the sky to earth, right before people's eyes. And he deceives those unconverted ones who inhabit the earth into believing him, because of the signs which he has given by Satan to perform in the presence of the first beast, telling those who inhabit the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded fatally by the sword and has come back to life. Revelation 13, 13-14, Amplified Bible This man will be able to bring fire down from heaven. I know of no preacher who can do that today, and yet he is a servant of Satan and uses these supernatural signs to deceive people. Satan is capable of many dramatic signs and marvels. Many Christians tend to think that if it is supernatural, it must come from God. This is not true, and we must keep it in mind. In Acts 16, we read about a fortune teller, a slave who follows Paul and Silas on the streets and says, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim the way of salvation. Acts 16, 17. She is the first person in Philippi to know who they are, but she is a servant of Satan. She has a satanical world of knowledge. How does Paul react? Does he make her a member of the church of Philippi? No, he cast the fortune-telling demon out of her. I see so many Christians who are being set up for deception by satanic supernatural powers because they are fascinated with the future through false signs and wonders. Signs do not establish truth. The Word of God establishes truth. John 17:17. 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart for your purposes. Make them holy. Your Word is truth. That's all we have to know. Anything contrary to the Word of God is not true or contrary to God. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 25, Listen carefully. I have told you in advance. In other words, you cannot say you have never been warned. In fact, those who read this book will never be able to say from now on that they have not been warned. Another event that takes place in the sky is Christ comes in the clouds. Some believe the church will gain immense political power and eventually take over the world. They think the church will set the world in order and hand it over to Jesus when he returns. However, this theory does not align with what scripture says. The Bible does not indicate anywhere that the world will be in good shape when Jesus returns. It suggests the opposite. The world will be in chaos, worse than ever before. Therefore, it will be up to Jesus, not the church, to restore order to the world. And at that time, the sign of the Son of Man coming in His glory will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth, and especially Israel, will mourn, regretting their rebellion and rejection of the Messiah. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory in brilliance and splendor. 
Matthew 24, 30. Notice the two thens in this verse. Zechariah prophesies that all the tribes of Israel will mourn when they see their Messiah and recognize that they were the ones who crucified him. Zechariah 12, 10 through 14, Amplified Bible. I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, unmerited favor, and supplication. And they will look at me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him as one who weeps bitterly over a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of the city of Hadadrimon in the valley of Megiddo over beloved King Josiah. The land will mourn, every family by itself, the royal family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves the family of the house of Nathan, David's son by itself, and their wives by themselves, the priest's family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei, grandson of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, each by itself, and their wives by themselves, each with an overwhelming individual regret for having blindly rejected their Messiah. This grief will spread to all tribes of the earth when they also see Jesus coming in glory. Part of the reason a false messiah will deceive people is the belief that Jesus' return might be restricted to one locale. Jesus says something quite different. Matthew 24, 26-27, Amplified Bible So if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out there. Or, Look, he is in the inner rooms of a house, do not believe it. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming and glory of the Son of Man. Everyone will see him clearly. Think of the Son of Man appearing with power and great glory in the clouds of heaven. There will be a triple glory when he appears, as the following verse shows. For whoever is ashamed here and now of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. And when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Heavenly Father, and of the holy angels. Luke 9, 26. There will be the glory of Jesus, the glory of the Father, and the glory of the angels. Isaiah 24, 23 says that the sun and moon will be embarrassed because their light will be so dim and ineffective by comparison. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Can you imagine it? And in addition, this light, even if it's so brilliant, will not hurt our eyes. Are you looking forward to this? It is something worth waiting for, worth enduring for. If we lose sight of it, we will be despondent because things will get worse. Remember, the pangs of birth will not decrease as the end approaches, they will increase. Falling Stars There are more signs in the heavens that will announce His coming. In Matthew 24, 29 reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not provide its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The words, the stars will fall from heaven, can be understood in various ways. Some are inclined to think they mean that the satanic angels in the heavenlies will be dethroned and cast down. Let me provide you two examples of this from the book of Revelation. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch flashing across the sky. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of fresh waters. The name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the waters because they had become bitter toxic. Revelation 8, 10-11, Amplified Bible. This is a satanic angel who is dislodged from heaven, and then at the beginning of chapter 9, Then the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star, angelic being, that had fallen from heaven to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit abyss was given to him, the star angel. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke like the smoke of a great furnace flowed out of the pit, and the sun and the atmosphere were darkened by the smoke from the pit. Revelation 9, 1-2, Amplified Bible. Satanic angels are represented here as stars in heaven. I do not envisage the whole body of the constellations falling. I envisage the powers of heaven, 
Satan's throne and his kingdom in the heavenlies being disrupted to the point where his angels start to be shaken out of their positions. Number 3. The Historical Significance Solar eclipses have held significant importance for various cultures and civilizations throughout human history. People have interpreted eclipses in diverse ways. In ancient societies, eclipses were believed to be manifestations of spiritual forces, either good or evil, which could elicit both positive and negative responses. The earliest recorded attempt at predicting solar eclipses dates back to the Shang Dynasty in ancient China, beginning with a solar eclipse in 2137 BC. Chinese astronomers carefully recorded astronomical events including eclipses and attributed them to the actions of cosmic beings. Eclipses were viewed as signs of change, with their occurrence indicating shifts in political power or society's fate. The ancient Mayan civilization kept record of solar eclipses and considered them to be symbolic of the conflicts between good and evil. Similarly, the ancient Babylonians also kept detailed records of eclipses, considering them to be ominous signs for rulers. The Babylonian astronomers developed complex mathematical models to observe the celestial bodies, and this laid the foundation for modern astronomy. Historian Herodotus reported that during a solar eclipse, the ancient Greeks interpreted it as a divine sign and stopped a battle between the Lydians and the Medes. During the medieval era in Europe, eclipses were often seen as indication of God's judgment or intervention. People sometimes interpret the sudden darkness caused by a solar eclipse as a warning of an impending disaster or as a call to repentance. Eclipses continued to fascinate scholars, artists, and theologians throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci and Johannes Kepler both studied eclipses to understand their underlying causes and cosmic significance. Artists such as Michelangelo and Raphael included eclipse imagery in their paintings, using celestial events as symbols of God's power and transcendence. In recent times, eclipses have played a vital role in improving our understanding of the universe. In 1919, British astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington famously observed a total solar eclipse which confirmed Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity and significantly contributed to our knowledge of gravity. Even today, eclipses continue to evoke curiosity and inspire awe. While we have gained a much deeper understanding of eclipses from a scientific perspective, their historical significance reminds us of the profound impact these celestial events have on human culture, spirituality, and scientific inquiry. Number 4. The Biblical Significance Although the Bible does not explicitly mention solar eclipses, it does contain passages that attribute great significance to celestial phenomena such as solar eclipses. The Bible portrays events in the sky as demonstrations of God's power and dominion over the natural world that He has fashioned. In the Old Testament, the book of Genesis describes how God creates the heavens and the earth with great orderliness and beauty. Genesis 1, 14-18 tells us, Then God said, Let there be light bearers, sun, moon, stars, in the expanse of the heavens, to separate the day from the night, and let them be useful for signs, tokens of God's provident care, and for marking seasons, days, and years, and let them be useful as lights in the expanse of the heavens to provide light on the earth. And it was so, just as he commanded. God made the two great lights, the greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. He made the galaxies of stars also, that is, all the amazing wonders in the heavens. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to provide light upon the earth, to rule over the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and He affirmed and sustained it. This passage emphasizes the reason behind God's creation of the sun, moon, and stars. Some interpreters of the Bible suggest that passages that describe periods of darkness may refer to solar eclipses. For example, in Amos 8-9, God mentions a day when, It shall come about in that day, says the Lord God, that I shall cause the sun to go down at noon, and I shall darken the earth in broad daylight. This imagery describes the sudden darkness that accompanies a total solar eclipse. Also, Joel 2.31 says, The sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. 
There are some scholars who believe that a particular verse in the Bible predicts future apocalyptic events that will be accompanied by celestial signs before God's judgment and renewal. The Gospel accounts of Jesus' crucifixion describe a period of darkness that covered the land at the time of our Savior's death on the cross. According to Matthew 27:45, this event took place. Now from the sixth hour, noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. This remarkable event highlights the universal importance of Jesus' sacrifice for the redemption of humanity. Although the Bible may not explicitly mention solar eclipses, it does contain passages that illustrate the spiritual significance of celestial phenomenon such as eclipses. Number 5. A Bigger Meaning A Finely Tuned Cosmos Total solar eclipses are not random phenomena. They follow a complex pattern of physical and mathematical rules that enable us to predict their occurrence years in advance. This pattern depends on the accurate size, compositions, relative distances, and movements of the Sun, Moon, and Earth with respect to each other. If any of these properties were to vary, total eclipses as we know them would never happen. Despite their rarity and uniqueness, total eclipses are not accidental events but rather a consequence of the precise alignment of celestial bodies. A Veiled Glory According to the Bible, the eclipse symbolizes not only the death of Jesus on the cross, but also the entire life of Jesus as the Son of God in human form. The eclipse is considered a moment in history when the glory of God was concealed in human form, much like how the moon can temporarily hide the light of the sun. Number 6. How to Watch a Solar Eclipse Well To make the most of the eclipse day, it's recommended to consult eclipse maps and predictions beforehand. Websites like NASA and NationalEclipse.com can provide valuable information about the path of totality, local weather conditions, and recommended viewing spots. By doing so, you can determine the best viewing locations and times for a safe and enjoyable experience. As we anticipate any upcoming solar eclipse, let's approach it with a sense of reverence that helps us discover the wonder of God. An eclipse puts God's wise creativity on display in dramatic ways. When we watch the moon cover the sun, we see the wondrous design that our Creator has put in place for the universe. The ultimate significance of an eclipse is that it invites us to seek God more and enjoy closer relationships with Him. Number 7. Is an Eclipse a Sign of the End Times? The Bible makes reference to several events that will take place during the end times, which are related to celestial occurrences such as the sun, moon, stars, shooting stars, and even solar and lunar eclipses. These celestial events are described in the Bible when it talks about what will happen during the end times. For example, when someone inquired about the end times, Jesus says, There will be signs, attesting miracles in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth there will be distress and anguish among nations, in perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea and the waves. Luke 21:25. It's natural that when unusual or not often seen space events happen, lots of people reflect on the end times. Why? Verses like Matthew 24:29 come to mind. Matthew 24:29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Isaiah 13.10 During a solar eclipse, the sun appears significantly dimmer as the moon passes between it and the earth, blocking its light. Similarly, during a lunar eclipse, the moon appears darker as it passes through the Earth's shadow and reflects less light. So, yes, there does seem to be a possible connection between an eclipse and the end times. It should be noted that there is no way to connect a specific eclipse with the fulfillment of the end times prophecy. Eclipses are actually quite frequent. A total solar eclipse occurs somewhere on Earth about once every 18 months. Partial solar eclipses occur multiple times per year while total lunar eclipses occur almost every year in most parts of the world. Jesus mentioned that a sign would appear immediately after the distress, a reference to the abomination of desolation in verse 15. This sign will appear during the time of great distress, 
great distress, which is said to have been unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and will never be equaled again, as stated in verse 21. It's important to note that Jesus said no one knows the day or hour of his return. Matthew 24, 36, Amplified Bible. But of that exact day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son in his humanity, but the Father alone. Eclipses are well-defined phenomena that can be accurately calculated and predicted down to the second. Therefore, it is unlikely that an eclipse could be the precise moment of Christ's return. For the time being, our curiosity about the timing of the rapture, the identity of the Antichrist, the start of the tribulation, and the meaning of the abomination of desolation will have to remain unanswered. The Apostle Peter gives us practical instruction in light of the end times. 2 Peter 3, 11-12 Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? We know that we will then see the new creation where righteousness dwells. Verse 13 Living our lives in anticipation of Christ's return requires us to lead a life of holiness and constant readiness. And an extra fact. Number 8. Is it true that the sun stood still? In the book of Joshua, we see a classic illustration of God's power. When the Gibeonites, an ally of the Israelites, were attacked by five kings, the Gibeonites sent an appeal for military assistance to Joshua. Joshua 10, 6-9 New American Standard Bible. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the valiant warriors. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them will stand against you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal. Once again, Joshua heard those comforting words from the mouth of the Lord, Do not fear them. He had heard them before, the victory at Jericho, and before the successful ambush of Ai. They guaranteed triumph despite the size of the opposition. The result? Israel fought, the Lord threw the enemy into confusion, and a great victory resulted. This account shows an unusual combination of the human and divine. The army battled, but God did two miracles for Israel's victory. The Lord sent hailstones, killing more enemy soldiers than Joshua and his men killed. As the battle raged, Joshua realized they needed more daylight to finish. In sight of all of Israel, Joshua prayed for the sun and moon to stand still. Joshua 10, 12-13, New American Standard Bible then Joshua spoke to the Lord on the day when the Lord turned the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon at the valley of Ajilon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jeshar? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky, and did not hurry to go down for about a whole day. God listened to Joshua's prayer and granted the Israelites victory over their enemies. This miraculous event was an extraordinary intervention by God in the natural order of things. God has the ability to do as he pleases with his own creation. If he wishes to halt or commence the motion of the sun, he can do so effortlessly. People who believe in a God of wonders have no difficulty accepting that the sun stood still. We can find a spiritual message in this miracle. At times, in the spiritual battles of life, God may supernaturally intervene immediately. In response to prayer, he may choose to perform a miracle, heal a condition, remove a problem, or provide for a need in a way that leaves us completely amazed. For the Lord, performing miracles is not a challenge. After the battle, Joshua and his captains brought the five kings before them. The captains then put their feet on the necks of the kings, as was the military practice of that time, to signify the complete defeat of the enemy. Number 9. Another time God showed his power in the skies. The Egyptian Plague 
After years in bondage under the Pharaoh, Moses tells the Pharaoh to let the enslaved people go. However, the leader refused and God sent a series of plagues on Egypt. The ninth plague showed the power of God over the skies. Exodus 10, 12-20 Then the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the land of Egypt and bring on the locust. Let them cover the land and devour every plant that survived the hailstorm. So Moses raised his staff over Egypt, and the Lord caused an east wind to blow over the land all that day and through the night. When the morning arrived, the east wind had brought the locust. And the locust swarmed over the whole land of Egypt, settling in dense swarms from one end of the country to the other. It was the worst locust plague in Egypt's history, and there has never been another one like it. For the locusts covered the whole country and darkened the land. They devoured every plant in the fields and all the fruit on the trees that had survived the hailstorm. Not a single leaf was left on the trees and plants throughout the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you, he confessed. Forgive my sin just this once and plead with the Lord your God to take away this death from me. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and pleaded with the Lord. The Lord responded by shifting the wind, and a strong west wind blew the locust into the Red Sea. Not a single locust remained in all the land of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again, so he refused to let the people go. The ninth plague came as a surprise to Pharaoh. For three days, the Lord simply cast darkness over Egypt. It was so bad, so oppressive, and all-encompassing that the Egyptians did not move during that period. However, the Israelites had light where they lived, which was a miracle. Exodus 10, 21-23 Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time, the people could not see each other and no one moved, but there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. Pharaoh made a half-hearted submission attempt, allowing the Israelites' families to leave but insisting that the flocks and herds stay behind. Moses, on the other hand, would not budge. He understood that partial obedience to God is disobedience. Moses insisted on taking all the livestock with them because the people would not know what they needed until they arrived in the wilderness. Pharaoh was so enraged by this that he warned Moses not to appear before him again. You will die the day you see my face. Moses concurred. Exodus 10, 24-29 Finally, Pharaoh called for Moses. Go and worship the Lord, he said, but leave your flocks and herds here. You may even take your little ones with you. No, Moses said, you must provide us with animals for sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord our God. All our livestock must go with us too, not a hoof can be left behind. We must choose our sacrifices for the Lord our God from among these animals, and we won't know how we are to worship the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart once more, and he would not let them go. Get out of here, Pharaoh shouted at Moses, I'm warning you, never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Very well, Moses replied. I will never see your face again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we come before you with open hearts and minds, seeking understanding and wisdom from your holy word, the Bible. We recognize that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, guiding us in every aspect of our lives. We acknowledge that without your guidance, we are lost, but with you all things are possible. Lord, we ask for your divine insight as we delve into the passages of the Bible. Grant us clarity of mind and open our hearts to receive your message with humility and reverence. Help us to approach your word with a spirit of teachability, knowing that you are the ultimate teacher. We pray for discernment as we navigate through the complexities of the scriptures. May your spirit illuminate the words on the page, revealing to us the deep truths and timeless principles contained within. Give us the ability to rightly divide the word of truth distinguishing between what is of you and what is of human interpretation. Father, we recognize that understanding your word is not merely an intellectual exercise, but a transformational journey of the heart. May the truths we uncover penetrate deep into our souls, shaping us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to apply these truths to our daily lives, that we may walk in obedience and live lives that honor and glorify you. We lift up those among us who may be struggling to grasp the message of the Bible. 
Whether they are new believers, seekers, or simply wrestling with the doubt and confusion, we ask for your special touch upon their hearts and minds. Pour out your grace upon them, Lord. Grant them the revelation and understanding they seek. May they experience the joy of discovering your truth and the peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, we also pray for unity among your people as we study your word together. Help us to approach one another with love and humility, valuing each other's insights and perspectives. May our discussions be marked by grace and mutual edification as we sharpen one another in our understanding of your word. As we grow in our understanding of your word, Lord, let it not puff us up with pride but humble us before you. Help us to remember that true wisdom comes from you alone and that our knowledge is but a small glimpse of your infinite wisdom. Keep us ever mindful of your grace and mercy, and may it compel us to share your truth with others in love and compassion. In closing, we thank you, Lord, for the precious gift of your word. May it dwell richly in our hearts and minds, guiding us in all we do. May our lives be a living testimony to the transformative power of your word, drawing others into a deeper relationship with you. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.